Hello and welcome to Read Becca. Today we are back for another video and we're gonna talk my five star so far. So I have read 16 five stars, which is pretty darn good. That is a 22% five star rate. And I think in part, at least, I'm just very lenient. I love books. And so I believe that as well, I've gotten a lot better at curating what I read. So a lot of these things were things that I kind of knew I was going to really like. This is also the first year that I've done any real amount of rereading. So there are some rereads on here. So let's actually start out with those rereads. And I'm going to try to go through this pretty quickly because a lot of these I've talked about before in weekend updates or individual reviews. So I will try to link some cards up above that talk more about what I thought about these books um, without spending a whole ton of time talking about them. So first up from my rereads, I have This Is How You Lose the Time War by Max Gladstone and Amala Lamuktar. And this is a far future sci-fi with time travel from two perspectives, red and blue. And they're two women who start writing letters to each other from opposing sides of the time war. And they kind of start to have feelings for one another. So this is a very prose focused novel and it was written uh, alternating between the two writers. So they each wrote one of the perspectives and um, it just is such a beautiful work. It's kind of abstract though. So um, on audio, which I did my reread this time with, I actually got a better sense of the narrative than I did the first time around reading in print, which seems kind of backwards, but it worked. So I really enjoyed this reread. Um, I read it for one of the our fantasy book clubs and thought it was wonderful. Number two from my rereads, I have Women Talking by Miriam Taves. This was my booktube spin number two pick. And uh, this was a reread for me from the first time around. I read it right after it came out and read it in about two days and just devoured it. This time I took my time with it. I really tabbed it up. Um, I, I love this story. It's very harrowing and it explores so much about the condition of being a woman. So this one is all about women in a Mennonite sect in South America somewhere. And there has been an outbreak of rapes where these women were drugged and raped in their homes at night. And this has been going on for years. Uh, the men who were perpetrating this just got caught and the other men from the Mennonite colony have gone to bail them out. Uh, so this is the account from a single narrator's perspective um, who is taking minutes of this meeting where the women have gathered in the barn to discuss what they're going to do about the situation, whether they should do nothing, stay and fight, or leave. So this is just wonderfully well written. Uh, immediately after reading this, I went out and bought pretty much all of Miriam Tave's backlog. So um, I enjoy the writing so much. It's not overly flowery prose, like the last one is pretty flowery, um, but this is just so insightful to read and concise. And it, it's a very slim work, but it does so much with it. So I highly, highly recommend this one as well. And I'm gonna say that for everything really. And number three on my rereads, from the Le Guin Project, I read The Dispossessed and I had read this years and years ago, uh, back when I was in college. We won't say how long that was, <laughs> but this is a very philosophical sci-fi work. We're following a scientist named Shevek, and Shevek is kind of a theoretical physicist on his planet, but his planet is very isolated. They have cut themselves off and they are kind of a, a mining planet moon of another planet. Now, by necessity, this mining planet has become effectively a commune. So it is a utopia where nobody owns anything really, everything is shared. If there is resource scarcity, it affects everyone equally. And so at the beginning of the book, we are seeing Shevek traveling to the other planet 
where in fact it's much more of a capitalist society and we follow split timelines of the past as Shevik is having a life on his own planet and working up to the scientific discoveries that lead him to leave his home planet and travel to this capitalist society where he's kind of faced with the horrors of this capitalist society where people are kind of out for their own property but also alongside that we get into the the difficulties of his own planet and and why it's maybe not quite as much of a utopia as he has always perceived it in the new lens of understanding the way things can be different from his planet's ideals. So Le Guin is basically almost always a five star for me. I love her writing. She is such a minimalist writer. She does so much work with so few words and um, you know this is not a massive novel but this is actually one of her uh, longer works in the Hainish cycle. So if you are into philosophical sci-fi this is one of the first places I would go to. So number four on my rereads is Catfishing on Catnet. It is a near future sci-fi thriller. It's all about Steph who has been moving around a lot with her mom and they're always on the run from her abusive dad. And so she is starting at a new high school where she kind of meets her first girl crush and is exploring her gender and sexuality. But she's also got this great group of found family on the internet who are from a cat pictures forum. And unknown to Steph, the cat pictures forum is run by an AI named Cheshire Cat. And this AI becomes very involved in her life. So I love this one. Like I said, great found family. That is the huge element to this. It's both a thriller and a feel good, cozy hug of a book. It is a bit like a mashup of Eliza and her monsters combined with Murderbot. So if you like either of those or both, you should check this one out. So next up, I reread a short story and just like Catfishing on Catnet, this is also by Naomi Kritzer. It was Little Free Library. So this is a obviously short story, uh, all about a uh, little free library. And a woman goes to check out the little free library one day and she starts a communication with a strange individual through the little free library. So I won't say more than that other than it's another really delightful cozy book and it's really surprising despite being so so short. So you should definitely check check this one out. Um, I will link that down below. All right, so no more rereads. We are done with rereads. On to my new five-star reads. So I kind of tried to group these, but they're, they're very loose groupings. So first up, we've got City of the Plague God by Sarwa Chata. I have read a bunch of the Rick Riordan Presents line uh, books, and these are all mythic fantasy set in contemporary, or I think most of them, if not all of them, are contemporary set. Um, and they're, they're for kids. They're just like the Percy Jackson series that Rick Riordan himself wrote, but these are all based in different cultural mythologies from Own Voices authors. So in this one, we are following a boy in New York City. His parents have a halal deli and he helps them out ever since the death of his older brother. So he is really struggling with his brother's death through the course of this novel. But he doesn't really have too much time to focus so much on his emotions because uh, some strange characters show up behind the deli one day and they think that he has the secret to immortality for some reason. So he, uh, he winds up on a wild ride and um, unfortunately the timing for this one couldn't have been worse uh, because it was written before 2020, but this does in fact follow a plague. I did this one on audio actually and Vikas Adams narrates it and I really highly recommend that experience because he was so good. So love this one. This is actually my favorite and first five star from the Rick Riordan Presents line. Next, 
I have talked about this one a little bit <laughs> already. Uh, when You Trap a Tiger by Tay Keller. This is a contemporary um, and it's also a middle grade. So this book is from a Korean perspective. Um, so Lily is our little main character and she and her sister and her mom are all moving up to the Pacific Northwest to be with her grandmother who they don't know on their way is, is in fact sick. And so on their way, she sees a tiger in the road, but it's clear that she's the only one who can see it. And then the tiger keeps popping up in her life uh, and tries to make a deal with her. But she knows that tigers are kind of tricksters, so you cannot trust a tiger. Uh, so she makes a plot to trap the tiger. Um, this is very much about um, who we are and the stories that we tell ourselves. Um, storytelling is a huge element of this and um, the premise about the tiger largely has to do with storytelling. So it very much explores that aspect of being able to change your story and who you are. And um, this is this is kind of a, a very sad one, but it's so, so good. Okay, so on to the adult stuff. So we have Lud in the Mist by Hope Mirrlees. And I reviewed this for my Women Write Classic SFF readathon. Uh, this is a 1920s work, I believe. It's a early classic fantasy. It is very whimsical and folkloric. Uh, we follow the mayor of the town of Lud in the Mist, who uh, very peculiarly <laughs> live at the fork of two rivers. And at the source of one of those rivers is fairyland. But the people of Lud in the Mist absolutely do not believe in fairies. They will deny that. Um, but then there is an outbreak of fairy fruit consumption <laughs> and people are, are going mad from the fairy fruit. So the mayor obviously has to deal with it. I really enjoyed this one. The sense of humor to it is so good and so unexpected. It shouldn't be, but you know, it being from the time when it was, uh, I didn't quite expect it to hit as, as hilarious as it did. So. It's beautifully written. Uh, I, I absolutely love that aspect of it as well. Um, and this is kind of one of those works that a lot of modern day authors reference as um, a source that really inspired them. So I was very happy to finally pick it up. And next, one of my favorites of the year, Sorrowland by River Solomon. Uh, so I have a complete review for this one, a standalone review. And this book is a little bit of everything. This is a major genre mashup. Uh, it has sci-fi, it has fantasy, it has horror. Um, this is a wonderful book. So in this we are following Vern who has fled a cult to have her babies. She has twins in the forest and she starts seeing a fiend in the forest that is after her um, and Along with that, her body has started changing. So things just can't stay the way they are forever. And uh, as she is deciding what to do about her situation, she also starts questioning what exactly was going on in the cult that she left. And so she spends the novel uncovering the secrets of the cult that she came from. And that is all I will say about that here. So I have loved everything from River Solomon so far. Um, all of their work has been five stars for me. And next, so we're in the sci-fi section, I think. <laughs> um, you'll notice I have a very big sci-fi lean this year, just overall, it seems. Uh, so next we have A Desolation Called Peace by R.K.D. Martin. And I, I absolutely loved A Memory Called Empire. This is big, epic space opera. Um, the first novel, very much follows an ambassador going to a planet who are who are the empire. They are these, this big colonizing force. And Mahit is an ambassador from an independent station. Um, so very much viewed as kind of primitive by these people. So in this one, which kind of has its own plot distinct from the first story, which was a murder mystery basically, this one is a first contact story. And I enjoyed this very much for how it tackles that. I think if you like uh, Arrival, uh, you will probably like this because this really focuses in on the slow 
work and linguistic elements of first contact and trying to communicate with something that is unlike yourself. I gave both of the books in this duology five stars. I absolutely love them and they are new favorites, which is why I purchased both of them after I read this. So next we've got more sci-fi. <laughs> so we have uh, The Echo Wife by Sarah Gailey and uh, this one is kind of a near near future sci-fi and it's not as much of a thriller as I think it was billed initially. Um, so, so don't go in expecting thriller, even though that's, that's what this gets tagged as a lot. Uh, but in this we are following, I think Evelyn is the main character's name, uh, and she is kind of recovering from the loss of her husband who has left her for another woman. But we find out that this other woman is in fact Evelyn's clone, Martine. And, um, one day Martine calls up Evelyn and she is in a panic. And so Evelyn doesn't really see why it's her problem to deal with. Uh, however, she she goes and meets up with her clone and discovers that her husband has been murdered. So together they figure out what to do. And as they are working through that, they get to know each other and get to know the relationship that they each had with the husband. We also see um, Evelyn's past, her working history, and we get this great exploration of the different sides of a woman, really, um, because very much Evelyn is this workaholic who is married to her lab, really, um, because she is the one who has been working on a project to clone humans. And then Martine is, is very much this carer and housewife. And both of them have had to give up parts of themselves in order to be that, um, that role. So it's, it's a very smart and feminist work. I think, um, I, I really need to work through all of the quotes and highlights that I made in this and notes, uh, in order to get together a standalone review for this one. And this is one I will be thinking about for a really long time. Uh, as well, I would say this is my first five star for Gailey because most of their previous work, or really I think all of their previous work that I've read has been novellas. And I think they do very well with the novella format, but it's always just left me wanting a little bit more. So this is the first novel length work and it completely confirmed exactly what I thought about their work and that I knew given a little bit more room to explore, they would really do well with exploring those ideas. So last book that I have here physically, and then we'll get into things that I do not have to hold up for you. And there's a lot more sci-fi. <laughs> um, so, so this one is Glory by Karen and Regis Bethencourt, and uh, they are photographers. So um, you may recognize the style of this from uh, the cover of N.K. Jemisin's How Long Till Black Future Month. They did do that cover photo. So this is this is an art book. Uh, this is a five-star art book for me that I purchased a copy to have for myself. Uh, it is gorgeous. So there are two page spreads in here. Um, and then there are uh, art sections. And then there are uh, like bios. So we have a model and then a bio for the model. And I just loved that these are all young people of color. They focused on getting models of very broad ranging backgrounds. Uh, so they're not all professional models. And uh, they focus on getting a range of skin tones and a very broad set of locations. Um, so these are not all American or all African kids. They're from all over the world. They got kids who are the financial support for their families. They have got kids who are the first person to attend school in their family. They got kids who have started their own companies or are um, running a charity or um, have raised huge amounts for charity. So they got a whole range of different types of children for this. And what I loved the most about this was the aspect of um, kids just in general 
are not taken very seriously when they talk about what they want to become. And I think especially children of color and of marginalized identities. Um, in this case, the writing in the bios takes it seriously and treats everything that they, they say they would like to be, regardless of if they're six years old or 16 years old, um, it takes that and treats it as if it is going to be true. I just love that element of it. Uh, I loved that it looks at a very hopeful and optimistic future for these kids. So that is all I've got to hold up. I've got empty hands now. Um, most of the stuff that I've got left to talk about, we've talked about pretty recently. So first we've got Pet, which I just talked about. Um, Pet is by A Quaking Messy. It is a younger YA story all about this world where monsters are gone and this young girl, Jam, um, awakens an individual from a picture her mother has painted who turns out to be the Monster Hunter Pet. And Monster Hunter Pet is therefore a monster. So monsters are not in fact gone out of the world. And this really explores the idea that when you become complacent, um, you can lose sight of those monsters in your life. So that was obviously one I loved. I really enjoyed Freshwater. That one I think was a four star for me. So this one, I just, every single element of it hit for me. So I loved it. So the rest are on the sci-fi list. So um, all ones that we have talked about very recently. So Relentless Moon by Mary Robinette Kowal. I just finished that up last week. <laughs> I don't remember. What is time anymore? Uh, it is the third book in the Lady Astronaut series. First one from a new character, Nicole Worgen. And she is a sly and savvy politician's wife who travels to the moon. And we kind of get this spy on the moon plot. So I've talked about that a bunch more in my weekend update when I finished it. So I will link that in the cards. Um, but I, I've five starred all three of the books in this series. I absolutely love it. It was on my five star predictions and surprise five stars. And the other one from my five star predictions was Network Effect. And that is number five overall in the first novel in the Murderbot series by Martha Wells. And I have loved all of these. So I think this one and Artificial Condition are my favorites. Artificial Condition was my favorite. Uh, in this one, we have Murderbot protecting someone as they're going off on a mission and things go real wrong real fast. So this for me was a little bit too action packed, but it was a, that was a very minor criticism of it. I just loved it through and through. It is so much about Murderbot exploring complex emotions and not really enjoying it. So we get that typical Murderbot snark. And finally, the last and most unexpected five star for me was Winter's Orbit by Everina Maxwell. And this one is a space opera with a heavy dose of romance. I think going in expecting like genre romance, you will not like it perhaps because it, it does have some heavy use of romance tropes, but it's probably not, you know, over 50% romance. It's much more leaning space opera. So this one is all about Janin and Kiem. And Kiem and his husband were kind of uh, the golden couple. And then his husband died. And so now because there is an underpinning of all of these interplanetary marriages holding up a treaty, he has to get married really fast. And Janin is one of the royal cousins who's kind of the black sheep of his family. And he's rehabbing his image because he he's done some bad things in the past, been a little irresponsible. And he gets saddled with a very sudden marriage to Prince Kim. So um, it's got that forced marriage, you've got a sharing one bed. Yeah, it's it's got all of those lovely tropes, but then it also has this really dense political plot because very quickly uh, the people overseeing the treaty become suspicious about the death of the husband and decide that that uh, the prince is in fact a suspect as well. So they're trying to, to clear 
his name. I just think that for me this one was the right book at the right time and that's why it was a five star. I don't think this was anything like groundbreaking or fresh. It just did what it was trying to do very well and for me that was exactly what I needed at the moment. So that was a lot. Um, I've got a huge stack of books here and I'm very happy that those were all five stars. I've had a great reading year. So that is all my five stars for the year so far. I think this was a really good reading year. Um, over 20% is wild. I think that is a fabulous rate and I can only hope my second half will be just as good. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you will like and subscribe if you want to see more.